I'm talking about this, let me let me get into the, the next section I was talking about here for thresholds and notifications. Uh, yeah, my name is Benjamin Day, Senior Systems Engineer uh, with PRTG. <laughs> um, when we talk about notifications we can do, let me just jump right into how those work and how those look. <coughs> Um, so you can see here, it's not just like, you know, one or two or three. We can have notifications set up for anything that you want. Uh, and then we can apply these anywhere we want them to go. Um, so if I start here on just a, um, let me just jump into one here. So you see we give it a name. We can say whether it's uh, started and, and running or paused. Um, we can come down here into summarization if we want to summarize uh, notifications or not. Um, down here, here's where I was talking about the placeholders that we can do for subject lines and emails and things like that. Um, and then down here, here's all the actions we can take. So, of course, send an email. Um, we can have it sent to a user or a user group in PRTG if we've gone in, set up users, put in email addresses, all that thing. Or if we just want to give it an email or a list of emails to send to, we can do that as well. Can the users integrate with Active Directory yes. or some other type of federation? Yep. Yeah, we can integrate with Active Directory and bring users. Uh, well, our integration with Active Directory is more so for authentication only. Um, when you integrate with Active Directory, you can sign in with your Active Directory credentials, but then a local account is made with uh, PRTG for that login. And that's really all we use it for is just to authenticate <laughs> so they can sign in with the same credentials they use for everything else. Um, the uh, subject line here, um, we can modify this to however we want. So there's a lot of users that are fine with just the default one. Then there are others that want to optimize for mobile devices uh, so that they trim the subject line down to just what they want to see. So again, a lot of flexibility in how you want that to look. Uh, and then we can send an HTML message, we can send a text format message, or we can do text with custom content, and then we can put in anything we want. We can fill it with placeholders, we can make it look however we want so that it's optimized to get you exactly what you need to see. And then we can also do priority as well. In your custom content, can, can you do percent device, percent name? Yes, percent. yeah, placeholders, yeah. Yeah, and we've got a KB article that has all the placeholders, what you know, what the the placeholder name is for it, and what it gives you in that, so that you can you don't have to guess or anything. You just go in there, choose the ones you want, and then copy and paste. Is there a multi-tenancy capability? Yes. Yeah, it's it, essentially it's using remote pro. <coughs> Um, but yeah, with MSPs, they'll well, put but from the reporting standpoint and the breakout roles based yes, access yeah. visibility, Holders, blah blah blah. Groups, exactly. Like yeah. yeah, yeah. So an MSP, they would install the core server at their location. Mm -hmm. They push a remote probe out to their customer. Mm -hmm. If they give their customer a login, yeah, they can lock down that login to just that remote probe. Mm -hmm. So when that customer logs in, they just see their environment, and for mm -hmm. all they know. It that's all that's for running. Them. Yep. Yeah, they would have. They would not be able to. Socks and yeah, et cetera. they wouldn't be able to differentiate between their installation and the entire thing because the user, because the, the web interface makes it look like from sensor counts and everything, they just see their stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cool. Uh, it can also be white boxed as well, so we can take out the Pestle logos, we can take out all that stuff, and we can make it say you know Bob's network monitoring or anything like that. Change the logos, change the colors, all that fun stuff, so they can. Uh, you know, they can make it their own uh, and add that little bit of extra flair mm -hmm. to it. And MSP licensing differs. <coughs> yeah, it differs from the uh, the standard licensing, and the uh, the salespeople can talk to that better than mm -hmm. I can. Um, we don't need those. <laughs> uh, here's where we can send out the push notifications. Um, it does it as a real push notification. Um, it doesn't have to use Boxcar, anything like no, nothing third party. When you install the PRTG app on your mobile device. Uh, your PRTG core server will go out to either Apple or Google and get the big, insanely long, unique identifier for your device. So when we send a push message, we're doing it the right, legit way. Uh, so there's nothing else you have to integrate or anything that can make that work. I know it says beta there, but the way we use the word beta is different from a lot of others. <coughs> Our betas are very high functioning, and we leave beta on there until we're like 110% certain that we want to take it off. So this is like Gmail was in beta for like five Google. years? Yeah. Exactly. Mm. Yes. Uh, Two-factor authentication? No. OK. No. Um, <laughs> I say that. You, you could. 
I, I mean, if I was going to do it, um, if I had a third-party service that could do the two-factor and then send me to a login for PRTG, we do have where your password can be a pass hash that could be in a, a URL, so it could point to the, this URL if you're like... a lot of work. No, no, no. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, that was good. I yeah. accept no. Well, if I did SAML or something like that, exactly. that would be good. Nothing that we have integrated, but we could work with other third parties that do a SAML solution, mm -hmm. uh, and then we, we give the tools where it can just zip you right in. Stick your yeah. web server behind firewall rules that, that require 2FA before you can get through it. It's, yeah. 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 It's easy enough to do. Yeah. I don't, you know, don't need... It, it's you're a web server. Before I can get to the web server, I got a two FA. Mm -hmm. That's good enough. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you're not a security guy, obviously, because it's not good enough. <laughs> exactly. Two factor. Yeah. Yeah. Notice, yeah. notice, Edward isn't here. <laughs> Especially if you're uh, you're coming at it from your mobile phone too. So two FA would be a lot cleaner. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Something native. Uh, a lot of users, when they want the two FA like that, what they'll do is they just won't publish it to the outside world. So they have to use the VPN on their mobile phone, and then they have two-factor for their VPN. Yeah, but if you're a service provider and you want a multi-tenancy, it, it's because, yeah, yeah. yeah. a little bit of a problem. Oh, yeah. No. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't know of many MSPs we have right now that are doing two-factor just because of that very yeah. problem. Then you know, it gets it, complicated. Yeah. yeah. You have to start giving RSA tokens out to customers, <laughs> and yeah, that just gets, yeah. You integrate with the other ones where it's soft-based tokens and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah. that too. Yeah. You use the Google Authenticator. You yeah. use the Blizzard Authenticator. So long as you're using something <laughs> That's too bad. Yes, but not SMS because NIST said no last month. Oh. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah NIST, NIST issued a report last month that said you shouldn't use uh, SMS for yeah. 2FA. You should tell yeah. every bank. Yeah. So easy to yeah. Yeah. I must tell my bank. <laughs> as well as Google. Yeah. 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 And, well, and Microsoft. and Microsoft. I use the SMS with Azure, you know. Yeah. Because it's, it's there. Better than nothing. Yeah. But it's not secure. On a sending an SMS pager message, um, the back end of it, I'll, I'll show you that here in a second, but here's where we just tell it. Uh, again, if we want to send to a user or a group, we can, when we build a user in PRTG, if we want to fill in all that information like email address and mobile number, we can do all that. Or we can just feed in our mobile number here. And then, of course, we can do the message that we want them to send, uh, that we want to send to them. And of course, yeah, we can work with placeholders there as well. So it's not just boilerplate, you know, this is down. It can be all kinds of different things there. Uh, Event log, syslog, SNMP trap, very basic stuff to send out to a site B, like a Splunk or anything like that. Uh, execute HTTP action, this is where we can uh, reach out, connect to something, uh, and then feed it post data as well. So again, that's how we can reach into a system, feed in information. Um, or if we've got any kind of a, um, application where just by going to a link, it enacts some kind of an action to happen on us, <coughs> as well as reactionary measure to something that's happened. Uh, on a particular machine. Like the only way to make this one thing go away is to reach in through the web API and kick off this one thing uh, to start working. And that's the only way to make it happen. Normally I'd have to do it, but I can feed in a PR2G and PR2G can do it for me. On execute program, uh, how this works is you basically, you write your script or your, take your executable, uh, you drop it on the PRTG server in a folder. So again, it can be a PowerShell script, Python script, anything like that. Um, and then here's where you feed it the parameters that you want to have, and then here's where you authenticate to it. So mm. we're not just stuck with using the default credentials that PRTG has. If it needs to run as a service account, if it needs to run as anything out Custom, there, we can customize how we want to do it, and we can give it a timeout as well. So in case it doesn't work, it's not just going to sit there and churn for like eight days before we finally realize, why has this been <laughs> running for the, like the last week and a half, you know? Uh, and then uh, if you're a subscriber to the Amazon SNS, we can use that as well. Uh, and then we can assign a ticket to our internal ticketing system that we have. Uh, really more popular so when you have a large IT department where maybe you've got like firewall guys, server guys, storage guys, and you want to be able to you know, assign them responsibility to something. Mm -hmm. It's not going to replace a real internal IT. inside a PRTG. Yes, it's not gotcha. going to replace a Can real. Can you get to see system. what the the, the yeah. tongue content? So, uh, to a user group or to just a particular user, Dear the Mark subject May. and content and all that fun stuff. <laughs> good, good times. Uh, question about this SNMP v three. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, All right. Absolutely. Right. I wasn't expecting that. Yeah. So, like, if I go to my devices here, and if I go to settings, 
<coughs> and down Still here. Under, like V2? No, we're not ready for that yet. Yeah. So we turn on V3. <laughs> yeah, all the time. Uh, we can, whether it's MD5 or SHA, user and password, encryption type, encryption key, all that fun stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Oh my God, nice. encrypted SNMP. We finally made it. <laughs> <laughs> Credentials for VMware, set <clears throat> server. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, um, one guy. Twofold. Uh, you can put in the root username and password for the host, and that's how we can connect to the host monitor directory mm -hmm. directly. Uh, or you can put in your credentials you signed to vCenter with, and then that's how we can monitor things through vCenter. We can mm -hmm. use vCenter as a gateway to uh, monitor things. That's a great way to do it. Don't necessarily recommend monitoring the host through vCenter as it's a little buggy. So, we recommend you monitor the host directly. And then in monitor, addition to monitoring that way. Yeah, and then monitor, the, but, but we recommend that you monitor the guests through vCenter as well as the data stores. We say the guests because when a guest vMotions, vCenter knows where it leaves and where it lands. A host, once it leaves, the host is going to throw a false alert good. saying this VM is down when it's not actually down, it's just moved to another host. Another host. And then two, you'd have to <coughs> rescan the new host Add the new VM, you lose all the data on the old sensor when it leaves that host. Whereas through vCenter, it doesn't matter how many times it vMotions, you're always going to have the historics on it, no matter where it lands. You only have the credentials to enter one system there, so if you have multiple systems. That so yeah, so so here's where here's where one of the other nice things about PRTG works. PRTG works on a model of hierarchy. I'm here at the root level. So if I specify settings here at the root level, it's going to cascade all the way down. Mm -hmm. Let's say I get down here to my uh, this hardware level here. And let's say for whatever reason, this uh, APC 2200, I've got a completely different SNMP community for this guy. I can go into settings for this guy, and you'll see mm -hmm. it's inheriting mm -hmm. everything from root. All I have to do is turn off inheritance, and now mm -hmm. I can specify specific credentials for anything at the device and even sensor level. So nice. I can bypass anything I'm inheriting mm -hmm. if I've got like a one-off system. Uh, like if I've got a, a single Windows system that um, for some reason isn't a part of the domain, so I need mm -hmm. to use specific credentials and do some other things to make yep, that yep. work. But that way I don't have <laughs> to go in and touch every single system in PRTG. I can let the 99% inherit and then what just works the for them. <coughs> yeah, and then yep. just handle the one-offs as I need to accordingly. Because I've dealt with uh, every host, every ESXi host had a different password. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. Yep. And that's a, that's a fairly common practice I've seen as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Get your spreadsheet out. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't even imagine that. That's a lot. Um, so, real quick here, let me... Uh, uh, Lead in, let me lead into this and, and talk about you know best practices and things like that. Uh, again, my name is Benjamin Day, systems uh, senior systems engineer with uh, PRTG. Um, when we talk about best practices, how to stretch PRTG's uh, capabilities and make it really work for you. Uh, there's two things, two big things on that. One goes back to what we talked about earlier with the mix of SNMP and WMI. <laughs> Um, using SNMP when possible in every situation we can uh, for things like CPU, memory, disk, all the simple stuff, because there's no difference. There's absolutely no difference between what an SNMP CPU sensor and what a Windows CPU sensor will deliver to you. They both deliver to you total CPU usage and then each core and thread. Um, so there's you know the obvious choice to go SNMP on that. The other uh, one being scanning intervals. So you'll see here, um, at the root level here, my default interval is every five minutes. So every five minutes, everything that's inheriting that gets scanned. Now, I can take that and just like what I did with the credentials, I can change that scanning interval for anywhere. So uh, what I tell a lot of my users to do is um, go in and mass edit that all at once. Um, all your SNMP stuff that's important to you, keep that tight. SNMP, we can do 60 seconds you know, all day long. Some of your mission critical stuff, we can kick that down to 30 <coughs> seconds. Uh, if it's really, really important, we want to maintain a tight uh, a monitoring cycle on that. Your WMI stuff, uh, you know, the important stuff, sure, leave it 60 seconds. But if you've got this one dev host and you're monitoring disk on it, what's stopping you from monitoring that like every 12 hours or 24 hours? There's a lot of users I have that are starting to do that now because like it's it's a dev host. I'm monitoring it just so if dev complains about it, I have metrics I can go back. But as far as disk storage goes, I don't care. 
<coughs> once a day is fine for me. You know, if it starts to run out of disk space, they're going to call me, and you know, that's a simple thing to do. But at least then I can at least know if something has happened. Um, memory, CPU, things like that, kick that up to like you know, 10, 15 minute scanning intervals so it's not hitting all the time. Uh, when we do that, we can really start to uh, add a lot of sensors to a PRTG installation. Um, I've seen installations that are running 20 to 30,000 sensors and running like a they're running like a well-oiled machine because they've gone in and everything that's important, they've gone tight scanning intervals, and everything that's non-essential, they've moved out to like at least five minutes, some 10 minutes and things like that. So what's the performance requirements for the server running the stuff? Because I've had some SolarWinds boxes that would just be uh, more resources and it's just getting destroyed and it may not even be using them, but it's yeah. running like garbage. For starting out and for most of our, I would say for about 85% of our customer base, uh, two cores, four gigs of RAM on a that Windows 2008 or up 2012 to, Up box. to about how many? Sensors. Yeah, thank you, up to about how many sensors? That would get me 2,500 SMP oh sensors. Oh my God, no, that's insane. And, <laughs> and probably 200 <laughs> WMI sensors. Wow. At 60 seconds intervals. If I bump all of that to five minutes scanning intervals, I can probably get Close to four to five thousand SNMP That's sensors, insane. and probably closer to three to five hundred WMI sensors. Is that going to change based on the number of uh, stats, whatever you call those, per sensor collected? Channels? Yeah. No, uh, we factor in like when we when we say this sensor takes up this much performance, we're factoring in the channels within that sensor. Yeah. So when we say that a uh, uh, an Exchange server sensor is this impactful, we're already taking into consideration. We know everything the sensor does yeah. at full, at full load. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, our, we have our WMI Exchange uh, sensor and our WMI Exchange Transport Queue sensor. So both of them have an abundance of channels. And then that's not even talking about the PowerShell script based sensors we have that do um, the uh, databases. Um, uh, we also have a database availability group one. Um, and we're, yeah, we're, we've added, we've it's added got a lot the of PowerShell scripting out. integration there? Yeah, that, was, you, that, was, that was one of my yeah, questions I had. Yeah, yeah, I wrote down. Yeah, you can create custom sensors based on PowerShell scripts. Oh, awesome. Uh, out, what's yeah. that QR code? So, <laughs> this is, no, this is, this, this is a cool thing. These so, are, this, uh, that was my three questions. So. That QR <laughs> code right there, you'll see that down there on the URL, it just takes you right here. What we put there is, if I go to a device, let's say I go back to this APC unit here. <laughs> it's got a QR code. I can take that QR code, I can print it out on a sticker, and I can nice. stick it on that APC. So now when I walk into the data center with my PRTG app, my PRTG app has a QR scanner. Oh, my <laughs> God. That's and it brings cool. it right up in the PRTG mobile app. So now I don't have to, like, if I walk into a data center, none of the servers are labeled, but they have that QR code. I don't have to know that server's name. I can just walk up yeah. to it and say, like, I want to know what the server's doing. I can scan the QR code, and it comes up in PRTG, and I know everything there is to know about it that's in PRTG. That's per device or per <coughs> sensor? It's, uh, it, it gets all the way down to per sensor. Okay. So, that's yeah, so... Put so, a QR so, code on a port? <laughs> <laughs> well, you put it on a network but, cable. Yeah, yeah true. Yes, on true. a network, yeah, absolutely on a network cable. Yeah. That's, that's, that's yeah. pretty cool, I mean, because it would be invalidated by <laughs> repatching. So. Yeah, dealing with but, crack units and all that other stuff, yeah, being able to right. go up and scan them would be awesome. Yeah, yeah. and not well, when you're that, pulling cables. And, yeah. yeah, and that raises a really good point too of monitoring things that you wouldn't think to monitor. Um, Libert, Johnson Controls, uh, environmental control systems. I've got a customer up in New Jersey that um, he was monitoring a lot of things. Uh, he was one of the cooler things I've seen. Um, they have a heat pump system for uh, you know heating and cooling everything, and then they also have a fairly large solar array to help with the cost and everything. Um, and he's got a system that's able to calculate based on what he's paying for power and what's being generated, how much he's paying and how much he's uh, generating versus you know what consuming and everything. Uh, using PRTG and using just a custom HTTP sensor, he's able to pull that in, and that metrics in PRTG, and he's got thresholds against it. So. He knows when he's out of the office or when he's in the office uh, how much he's been consuming over time, and he can run reports down on PRTG. Um, likewise, uh, to that, one of the other cool things he did was with his library unit, um, he plugged in the web card, got SNP up and running on it. Now he's able to track um, when the compressor's not running and running, uh, the water pan level, 
because it's got a meter in there. So if it hits that, you know, he gets an alert in PRTG and says, you know, the water pan level is high; it needs to be emptied. Uh, but the big one is uh, return air temperature versus uh, out air temperature. So he can see on those days when he's looking at his uh, S and P enabled weather station, and you can see the outside temperature is this. He can see how effective his computer room AC is in terms of cooling the data center on really hot days. Uh, and then too, since he's up in the Northeast on really cold days as well. So he can make sure mm. that it's doing its job, that it doesn't need to be serviced or anything like that. That it's Good integration with SCADA systems and other stuff like yeah. that basically. There's a, there's a company in Europe that's written an integration uh, piece that uh, PeerTG can talk to to talk to SCADA systems. Mm. Yeah. yeah. SCADA? Building management stuff. Okay. Yeah. Power station control. Water, yes. water pumps. Lots Elevators. Of yeah. yeah. <laughs> lots, of, lots of things I've never worked with. When I saw it, I was a little mind boggled by it. But then I thought about all the places I've worked in. Where it's, power yeah, plants. Right. Multi-tenancy buildings. Dripping oh, yeah. water. And vents, yeah. valves. Water leaks. Anything yeah. that can be open or closed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Industrial oh, no, control. Yeah. Yeah. Stark. Yeah. Tony Stark? Not yet. It's, Stark Enterprise. It's just the last time I did it, it was long before there was a standard. So, <laughs> Skato was just... What's a, a sensor that... It's, People request that you guys don't have. So. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Same age. Most often, it's a sensor for a particular hardware vendor. Um, and sadly, one of the ones we get a lot is for EMC. And anyone who's... <laughs> yeah, good luck. Yeah. That's easy. All I had to say was the... <laughs> SMIS provider. Um, that's one thing that we Scum don't... can do it. Um, that, that Throw up a little thing. in my mouth there. Uh, I... I, I hate to admit something when we can't do it, something, but right now we do not have any SMIS based sensors, and uh, I'm I'm working as hard as I can to make them realize that that's a pretty important thing. Just a custom SMIS sensor where you can specify uh, custom strings and stuff. Just like we well, like we have uh, SQL sensors that we've written for that. You know, we, we've got SQL sensors for every version from 2005 up to 2014, where <coughs> Uh, the the standard SQL sensors monitor you know the most important metrics that Microsoft has identified. Mm -hmm. Then we also have just what we call our Microsoft SQL V2 sensor, and it's literally you add the sensor and it has a field for connection string and query. So that's our that's our way of saying yeah here's all the metrics that Microsoft says to monitor. Now for all the stuff that you want to monitor, put in your connection string yep. and give your get your DBA to give you the T SQL script that he wants to monitor, and then turn that sensor loose for him. You know, um, same thing can be said for what I'm hoping eventually one day will be an SMIS sensor very similar to that, where it can just connect and then you know go from there. Or Those of us who live in the storage world just hope SMIS will die. Or, or that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and that's the other thing too. We're finding a lot more of the storage solutions uh, are going to SNMP. Um, NetApp is awesome. NetApp gave us a piece of hardware that we were able to test with. Um, Nimble, I've talked to them a lot of times uh, when I'm at shows. They have a, a full-blown S&P, MIBs and everything. Yeah. Uh, Dell Equilogix, same thing. Uh, you know, EMC seems to be the only one that they're playing by their own rules. And, you know, they kind of can. When you're an 800-pound yeah. gorilla, you yeah. wherever you want. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, um, but the good thing is, is most of the other ones that are very popular amongst the consumer base that we're really looking at, which is that SMB yeah. realm, yeah, they're buying the net apps, the nimbles, the things like that that we can get into and work with on a fairly simple basis. Yeah. So you do ESX and vCenter discovery. What about VC ops? Can you pull any of that data down? No. Okay. Not right now. Uh, the, the only, we, we don't integrate with like VC ops or NSX or anything else like that. Yeah. Um, what about if I send you traps? Yes. Now, if you send me traps, yeah, I can set up an SNMP trap receiver. And I can receive traps all day long. Same thing goes <laughs> with uh, syslog messages. We have an SNP trap receiver sensor, as well as a syslog message receiver sensor, where you can go in and specify if I get this particular trap message or anything close to this particular trap message, uh, error. Put the sensor in error, and then whatever notifications I've got kick in and alert me. Mm -hmm. um, that's become a real popular one in terms of older hardware that. Although it has SNMP community capabilities, there's just not any OID right. support for it at all. But it'll send traps all day long. Yeah, nobody wants to do it, use a MIB compiler. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's not fun. Especially when you get companies where it looks like um, a high schooler doing their summer internship wrote the MIB file. <coughs> 
many times by trust because they did. That's how it looks like that was that, that's how it happened. <laughs> that was their go-to-market plan. Yes. Yeah. Many times I've had customers say, I can't get this MIB file to compile. Can you help me with it? I'll get it and I'll look at it. And I had two MIB files, and you could see that they were contiguous in their file structure. The end of one was the head on another one. I, I, I've not uh, made that up. Yeah, I've oh, seen that a lot. I was, I was, that's normal. I was flat. Sounds that, like Cabletron. Yeah. I don't believe you. God, you must prove I was, this. I was flat. I could <laughs> <laughs> um, Last thing I want to get into here, um, maps and reporting, because I think it's uh, probably, uh, the reporting I'll do a little bit on, but maps, I think that's one of the, that's. Just started with maps. I know, right? I guess right. the maps. Yeah. Uh, you got four minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so when we talk about maps, uh, this is where we differentiate ourselves from a lot of other solutions out there. Um, so let me just show you like the one that I built for VMworld that I've actually got on a screen down there. This product has come a long way. It has. So this right here is a map that I built. So I've got a lot of different elements going on here. I've got a nice little VMware uh, vSphere 6 logo that I just picked off the internet and just dropped in here. Same thing with a nice little VMworld 2016 logo. Uh, but then I've got objects that are relayed back to PRTG. Uh, I've got an ESX host here that we built in Visio, and then I saved, saved it after I went in and populated all the stuff. Uh, and now I bring it into here so that I can have it. Um, we've got a big HP Blade chassis as well that we populated all the stuff and we can bring it in here. Uh, and then the great thing is, is that with the map designer, very similar to Visio or pretty much anything else, I can take and I can layer things on top of that. So if I wanted to, I could grab this ESX host here, I could move it, um, I could resize it. It makes it very difficult to see what's beneath it. Well, I can, uh, I can change the layering on that. So I can put it all the way on the floor. Or I could take it all the way to the top. But then I can layer things on top of it. So now, this Visio stencil I've created that's useful in itself because I see what the device is supposed to look like in the rack and I also see how it's configured hard disk wise or blade chassis or anything like that. But now I can also layer on top of it um, things that are dynamically associated to it in PR2G. And give me a second and I'll show you the, uh, uh, the HP Blade one uh, that we're using downstairs as well. Um, but then the other thing that comes into it um, are some of the elements we have uh, underneath it. So we have all these channel gauges here. Uh, this is a host performance sensor for an ESX host. So I've got CPU ready, CPU usage, data store, disk, memory, uh, network, and even power consumption. And I've got all those channel gauges there for me. Uh, and I've got the thresholds that have been set on them, You know anything I've set. Uh, here I've got a data store so I can see the free space on it. I can see it's online accessible, the total available capacity, how far provisioned it is. I've got any uncommitted bytes. Uh, and then down here I've got uh, trees set up that show me all my guests that I'm monitoring so I can see who it is, where it is, I can see its current status, uh, and the last value on the primary sensor which is CPU usage. So I can see the CPU usage all nice at a glance for all my guests there. Uh, and then just to give an idea of how it's built out here, uh, I can bring in a tree where it actually shows uh, from my vCenter, here's all my hosts, here's all my guests, and then here's all my data stores. Completely customizable. Uh, I can bring in elements from the internet. I can also bring in elements from my intranet. I can easily just do an iframe and drop in a SharePoint page or if I've got a company intranet page I want to have something for. I was talking to a gentleman downstairs that works for a 911 operator. Um, they have a specific 911 application that's web-based that they wanted to be able to have on a map with all the PRTG stuff, and that's totally plausible. Another big one is IP security cameras. Most IP security cameras nowadays, they have a link that is, it's a big long link, but it points directly to the video feed. No other web interface or anything. Like you go to it in a browser and it's just the video feed. Um, it's very easy to put that in a PRTG. In fact, in Nuremberg, uh, in our home office, we've got big screens up on the wall that have maps and everything, and one of the things that we have is we have the security camera feeds on there that are around the elevator, you know, in addition to all the other stuff we're showing. Um, Google API calls for traffic and weather, stuff like that. That's a big one that I point to my users that are covering a very large geographical area, is watch your locations and where they are 
and on your big map that you're going to have in your knock or anything like that, put a weather map on there. Because the last thing you want to do is not be aware of a major storm system moving through that may cause an outage, and then you're going to sit around, you're, you're going to sit and run around in circles trying to chase a ghost that's more often than not because the carrier has lost power or has, you know, had a, uh, a tree come down and knock out, uh, you know, a, power, a, a, a data line or something like that. You know, be aware of things that are uh, happening outside of your network, especially when you're, you know, when you've got all those elements involved, you know, when you're trying to keep uh, data up and you're relying on all these third party systems like, you know, telco carriers and things like that. Be more aware of what's happening uh, on things that you can't control. Uh, so that way you can at least be informed. So when people come asking you, why isn't this working? I'm not sure, but I think that big red blob on the weather map right there, right over where our office in Nebraska is, may have something to do with the fact that we can't reach them right now. So could you overlay that, a, a big geo map on the background? Here's yeah. all my remote offices mm -hmm. yeah. and the health of each office. So one of the things you notice in PRTG, when I go back to the root device tree here, I've got this little geo map right here. When I set up a device in PRTG, one of the fields I can populate is location. I can feed it latitude, longitude. I can put in just a city. I can put in an address. One of my customers that runs the, uh, what was it? It was the other day. Not San Jose, San... Um, Diego. San, San something Valley uh, Library. San Fernando? Not San Fernando. It started with a V. I can't remember, but it was Valley. in California. Uh, so yeah, yes. <laughs> um, the public library, uh, they have like 108 libraries in that region that mm -hmm. they cover. And two years ago at VMworld, when I saw the guy and talked to him, he was using the freeware version, and he was just looking at ping on all the computers that had uh, internet connectivity at the libraries that they were managing. But he put in the location on all of them, so he had this nice geo map that was centered on his region that had all these dots on it. And he was able to see at a glance. Red or green? Red or green. Yeah, all that matters. Yeah, That's right. all that matters. Right. So yeah, you tag everything with a location, and you get a geo map like this, and then you're able. This is an element that I could bring into a map. Right. I could bring this into a map, and yeah, absolutely. If I could go out and get a weather API that just gave me the storm information, yeah, I could layer that on top of it. You know. So since you mentioned the free version, what's the difference? Uh, free versions capped at 100 sensors. Uh, and there's no formal support for it. It's just KB articles and you know finding an extensive stuff community built over 20 years. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 100 sensors. Yes. Basically. Mm -hmm. So 10 servers. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. For mo, I, uh, I find it uh, most users that have the software purchased at their work that the 100 sensors is more than enough for them to run at home. Just to monitor their little network they may have at home for mm -hmm. test stuff or whatever they're running, so. Yeah. Runs as a VM? Uh, yes, we don't have an OVA or anything like because it runs on Windows, but yeah. It oh, yeah, 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 it runs on Windows. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It. yeah. yeah it's come a long way since it started as a Windows port of MR. Yeah, that's what yes. I was just thinking. And we still have people running old versions. I had a customer come up downstairs still running version six. And we don't we don't have a clear upgrade path from that, but it works. You know, it's like it's like those large institutions that are still running old versions of Novell. They're not going to go away from it because it does what they need it to do. You know, uh, and it's just great software. Yeah, uh, I, I wouldn't say that if I hadn't used it before I started working for the company. Um, on a, I don't think I've updated in five years. Yeah. Uh, just on a personal thing, one of the things that was a big thing for me when I worked with PRTG, um, up until the point when I worked for the last company I worked for, I never had network monitoring. So I was constantly just, you know, <coughs> we have to go by word of the users and we have to go by whatever we've set up to know if anything is down or not. And we have to be so reactionary and so reactive rather than proactive that it just gets exhausting after a while. Um, the last company I went to, when they had PRTG and when I started learning and started working with it and started building maps and everything, um, I had maps that went on a big screen in the office that I shared with the sysadmin. I had maps that went on my tablet. I even had a little map that went on my phone. Um, and what was so great about that was is that my day-to-day -day went from having all these things open, like having vCenter open, having uh, my Microsoft MMC open, having all this stuff open, to just having a one tab open with the sunburst on it and seeing what was, what was up and down. 
Uh, and I was able to work on the things that I wanted to work on. Everything that I thought to myself, I want to make that change. Like, I want to rewire the data center, or I want to work on this because I think it'll be a good thing for the company. I was able to do that. When you work on the things you get to work on versus the things you have to work on, it just makes you generally happier to do your job. So that's just my little, uh -huh. my little personal spiel about uh, PRTG and how it affected me in the, the place that I was working with it.